At least one accessible route shall be provided within the site from a number of places. You'll want an accessible route from any accessible parking spaces or accessible passenger loading zones. Many people, possibly most people, will arrive at a site in a vehicle, and so there needs to be an accessible route from any accessible vehicle parking or loading zone to the accessible entrances that they serve. It's no good to be able to park if you cannot then get to the accessible entrance. If people are not arriving in their own vehicle, they may be arriving via public transit, so there must be an accessible route from any public transit stops to the accessible entrance. If people are not arriving in their own vehicle or via public transit, they'll be utilizing public streets and sidewalks. These are all common places to find curb ramps, as it is not possible for people using wheeled mobility devices or with limited ability to lift their feet to get over the curb to a sidewalk, which may be a rise of several inches. If there are stairs to a building entrance, you may also need a ramp or grating to get into the building. This gets someone with a mobility disability from any of the multiple site arrival points into the building. And at least one accessible route shall connect each story and mezzanine in multi-story buildings and facilities. This is typically where we see an elevator come into play. There is an exception to that rule, however. In private buildings or facilities that are less than three stories or that have less than 3,000 square feet per story, an accessible route shall not be required to connect stories. So, if you have a two-story building, with some exceptions, you are not required to have an accessible route to the second story. Or, if you have a tall, skinny building with less than 3,000 square feet per story, that is another case where you may not be required to have an accessible route. This exception remains in place as long as the building or facility is not a shopping center, a shopping mall, the professional office of a healthcare provider, a terminal, depot, or other station used for specific public transportation, an airport passenger terminal, or another type of facility as determined by the Attorney General. These building types are required to have an accessible route between each story and mezzanine, even if they are less than three stories tall or have less than 3,000 square feet per story. There are other exceptions to the rule of one accessible route connecting each story in multi-story buildings. We won't go into them all here, but you can find them in the exceptions section under 206.2.3 in the 2010 ADA standards. Some of these exceptions are for detention and correctional facilities, residential facilities where all the accessible dwelling units with mobility features, all common areas and public use areas serving those units are on an accessible route, and multi-story transient lodging, such as a hotel, as long as there are sleeping accommodations for two people minimum on a story served by an accessible route. The gist of this is that you need to look carefully at where you need to make a second floor or above accessible. When in doubt, opt for more accessibility rather than less. Speaking of making a second floor or above accessible, Section 206.6 in the 2010 ADA standards refers to elevators. It states that elevators provided for passengers shall comply with Section 407, which are the accessibility requirements for elevators. Where multiple elevators are provided, each elevator shall comply with Section 407, meaning each elevator is required to be accessible. In Section 303.1, General, where changes in level are permitted in floor or ground services, they shall comply with Section 303. Changes in the level of a one-quarter inch high maximum shall be permitted to be vertical. As you can see here, we have a quarter inch high maximum vertical, and that is because that is the maximum that someone in a wheeled device, such as a wheelchair, can safely navigate over without worrying about tipping the chair or other mobility device. Changes in level between a quarter inch high minimum and a half inch high maximum shall be beveled with a slope no steeper than one to two. That helps someone who is using a wheeled mobility device roll over that change in elevation. Changes in level greater than half inch high must provide a ramp and comply with section 405, or a curb ramp and comply with section 406. Here we see someone in a wheelchair at a driveway. There is about a one inch lip from the driveway to the street. 
those small front wheels cannot safely get over that lip without endangering the person in the wheelchair. They could tip over backwards or get knocked out of the chair, and then they might end up in traffic on the ground. Now we see someone in a wheelchair at a curb ramp where there is no lip and the transition is blended. You can see that the small front wheels of the wheelchair had no problem making the transition from street to sidewalk. Let's go over the requirements for a curb ramp. 